enjoyed the first half. I thought it was awesome, and uh, it was a lot of information to assimilate. Uh, I'm going to have to get the archives, which is pretty cheap, by the way, five dollars a month. Um, we got a special going to the end of the month. If you donate fifty dollars and write in the little thing box down there, uh, Silver Streak, you'll get a, a one ounce uh, bar of silver. You got to put your address in there. You won't get it. And if you do seventy five dollars, you get a ball cap. You got to write ball cap in there, so it so it sticks out, so we know where it goes. So uh, we need need it. Uh, this is how we keep doing these kind of shows: is y'all supporting us? Isn't that right, Mark? Yeah, and we have more interesting shows. Good, good shows stuff to- coming. <laughs> Yeah, I I I I think Julie's going to be back uh, a few more times. We just barely scratched the surface. Oh, she's got a lot of information. She was awesome. I thought. Yeah, I I I, I was very nice discussion, and I think we're going to be continuing that with our next guest. Uh, Yeah, uh, I think Mary uh, Joyce was on with us uh, about a year ago, maybe. It was around that. Yeah, it, it, it was, it, it's been a while, and it's uh, time for her to come back. And if uh, uh, you remember the show from last last year, uh, you know, Mary is a uh, ufologist, Bigfoot researcher, author, and you know, she's going to be uh, uh, returning tonight to uh, discuss a, her new book, uh about underground bases in the western North Carolina mountains. Uh, might get in some a Bigfoot update. Uh, a whole bunch of other things we can get into uh, over the next 50 minutes or so. So uh, might as well just get Mary on, just start ta- talking. Hi, hi, Mary. How are you doing? Hi, Mark. How are you doing? All righty. Yeah, how? So, uh, I think when you were on last year, yeah, there was a little bit of uh, yeah you know, Bigfoot information that was yeah you know, just you were just starting to uh, look into. Uh, you know, your uh, website has. Uh, some updates with photos of some footprints. Uh, yeah, this little like den kind of thing. Uh, can, can you explain? You want what, me to dive? Want me to dive into the Bigfoot subject? Yeah, just for uh, for a little bit. It, it it is kind of the Halloween season. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll yeah be happy to do that. Yeah, yeah, um, you're. We yeah, started and, doing stories about Bigfoot uh, uh, a number of years ago. Uh, I edited a, a website called Skyships Over Cashers, and sent, we've had maybe five different locations in the western North Carolina mountains where we've had uh, Bigfoot um, observations. The most recent project is an ongoing one. It seems to be very active. And uh, recently we posted footprints um, on the website, and if you go to the home page, there's a, a listing for ETs and, and Bigfoot, and anybody can go and check on those. But there was a, a lady in one of the mountain areas here who uh, was going home one evening, and it was dusk, and she saw some beautiful ferns by the side of the road, and she decided she'd pick some for her her yard. And when she got out of the car, she smelled something that she described as pungent and sickeningly sweet. And then she looked just beyond the ferns, and there was a giant footprint there. Well, it was getting almost totally dark, so she went home, and the next morning returned with a a tape measure, and the footprint was 16 inches in length. And in the daylight, she could see a number of footprints going up the the mountain hill, which was really very steep. Uh, This has evolved to another point where... um, where we had gotten samples of Bigfoot hair that we had sent to a lab uh, in Canada. And the lab said that uh, they could only get the maternal side. And anything unique about the Bigfoot seems to be on the daddy side or the paternal side. And they said we would have to get something that was either blood, skin, a hair follicle, not just the hair, uh, or Bigfoot poop, which is known as scat. 
and uh, in the area where these footprints were seen, there was some very unusual scat in the same area. So that was collected and sent off to the lab, and we are waiting for results on that one. And it's taking longer than it did the last time, which means it's not a simple uh, answer like, uh, you know, it's just maternal DNA. So the longer it takes, actually, the more optimistic we get that they might find some evidence. And Mark, you're aware of another book that I did, which is not the subject for tonight, but it's called Tangible Evidence of Jesus Left Behind for Us to Find. And right at within a few days of sending off this Bigfoot sample to the lab in Canada, we found, it, found out it's the same lab that did the DNA testing for the bone fragments in the uh, ossuaries or bone boxes for Jesus and Mary Magdalene. And I thought that was a very interesting, uh, uh, I don't know what to call it, coincidence? Well, well, uh, that that, that would have to be a reputable lab to get a uh, a, a commission like that or a request to... Right, because one of the men who was involved with that was um, Dr. James Tabor with the University of North Carolina. And so if he chose that lab, uh, that in itself gives it... uh, credibility mm-hmm okay well that's that's good to know uh, it that, that makes a lot a, a lot of difference when you, you know you start writing reports and say well you know look at you know their the, the history that they've you know had with uh, very important artifacts or you know dealing with the you know sensitive subjects so okay that's great And I'll add a little bit more. There's a whole lot more on the website because, uh, uh, there, and it's a long story, so I'm not going to get into the whole thing, but there was one um, um, family property that was in a bowl-shaped valley in the high mountains with ridges all the way around it and a very narrow road that went down to this uh, bowl-shaped opening in the the, uh, ridges. And... uh, they were fixing a dam for the pond, and when they did, they jackhammered into something that felt very hollow. Well, after that, they started having problems with the Bigfoot. And in in retrospect, it looks like they punched into a cave where the Bigfoot were living, and they weren't too happy about it. And they essentially invaded the property, uh, letting their... Uh, <laughs> frustration be shown and so we've got writing on the wall of this house that uh, the Bigfoot have done the the people actually moved out um, Mm. two years ago but it's uh, most of the experiences aren't that way and they have the Bigfoot have even let up in that situation and actually left a gift at the front door so I guess they've been somewhat forgiven for um, punching a hole in the top of their cave (laughs) okay that, I, I've I've never heard that. So that's a, a new dimension of uh, Bigfoot behavior. Uh, there was a lot of it. We, we have, there's many many pictures that go along with these stories. And I had my own experience. One of the mountain men took me back uh, far into the woods where he said there were caves that he was real certain the Bigfoot uh, would take shelter in. And so he led me with a, a machete to cut down weeds to get there. And as we got closer to the cave location, there was a um, a bird call that wasn't quite a bird call. I mean, it sounded real, but not real. And then uh, further ahead on the path, close to where the cave was located, there was another solitary bird response, and then everything went silent. So I'm pretty sure I was hearing one Bigfoot sig- uh, giving a signal to another one that uh, we were approaching their territory. Hmm. Interesting. So, okay, uh, uh, Mary, do you want to say anything else about uh, Bigfoot, or do you want to move on to your new book? We can move on to the new book. I just encourage people to go to skyshipsovercashers.com and look under the Bigfoot section because there's um, quite a number of stories there. They all have photographs, so it's not just words. Um, and I think a lot of people would find it quite interesting. Uh, and with uh, that, uh, we can move on to the to the book if you like. 
yeah, yeah, we are putting uh, sc uh, the scholarships over cashers in, in into the chat rooms uh, as as well. Okay, so uh, yeah, what? Okay, uh, what's you have another e elaborate book title, and that then you know what are people seeing? What are they reporting to you? And um, maybe talk, okay, talk about the, the, the short the first. short title on that is <laughs> underground military bases. The the long title is underground military bases hidden in North Carolina mountains. And it's kind of interesting because all five of the underground facilities that I've written about in the book are located either under or adjacent to major tourist attractions. There's one under the Smoky Mountains National Park, one under uh, Mount Mitchell, which is the tallest mountain east of the Mississippi, one under Sugarloaf Mountain, which is adjacent to Chimney Rock, which is a, a tourist attraction. Uh, one in uh, Linville Gorge. And the last one is under and to the west of uh, a major rock formation called Devil's Courthouse, which is right along the Blue Ridge Parkway. Um, it might seem kind of puzzling that some of these things are located, let's say, in the Smoky Mountain National Park. And I was puzzled about it for a long time, was puzzled about it because uh, people for years have talked about seeing foreign troops in the park, uh, Russian and German and what they call the Blue Hats or the National uh, United Nations. And then I found out about something that I wish everybody would check into, and it's called the World Heritage Treaty. And our country signed this treaty during the Nixon administration in 1972, and we gave up our sovereignty of certain parks and certain historical places to the United Nations. So even though we as a country um, fund and tend to the uh, care of uh, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, it is officially owned by the United Nations. So we don't have jurisdictions over it or jurisdiction over it. And personally, I think that treaty ought to be torn up. And uh, uh, I don't think we should give up our, our rights to uh, that kind of a, you know, space. Why? What, what was the reason behind tur turning over th these parks to the UN? The original reason sounded very good. It was to protect those uh, special places so they would uh, stay the same forever and ever. What's proving to be true is that this gives um, those who might want to control the world uh, the ability to um, uh, do what they wish with these areas. And Mount Mitchell is a, a very famous one. Um, as far as the facilities go, um, um, our witness on, in that particular situation uh, is a former military person. He had a professional career in the medical business or medical field. And when he retired, he uh, wanted to volunteer with the National Guard here in North Carolina. When they found out that he at one time had had clearance with the FBI and Army security, they decided to use him in a different way. And he was put in charge of a squadron to observe uh, Mount Mitchell. And they went in undercover uh, uh, through the forest and taking um, the paths that the animals would take. And they just observed this from all angles of, or all sides of the mountain. And one day they saw uh, UN troops, what he calls blue hats, coming out of the backside of Mount Mitchell. They would come out in sets of two. There would be a lead man who would have one of these fold, fold, foldable uh, shovels, and a man behind him would be carrying a very heavy uh, backpack, uh, the kind that would be in re reinforced with metal because it was carrying so much weight. And there were four teams of these sets of two. And one set w uh, of men would go down the north side, one the south side, east and west. Um, 
the lead man with the shovel would stop periodically and dig a hole in the ground along one of the animal trails, um, and the hole would be about a foot deep, and then they would pull a sensor out of the backpack and bury it in the hole and cover it up. So the entire mountain is covered with these sensors, and they're very sophisticated. They can tell if it's an animal or a person, and so nobody can really sneak up on the, the mountain. And at the same time that his squadron was observing this, there was another squadron at a nearby town called Marion. And they were there uh, after dark when a train came in. And between 20 and 25 tanks, military tanks, were unloaded from the train onto tractor trailers. And then they caravaned up the mountain, up to Mount Mitchell. And they never came down again. And according to... um, the people who trained this man that we call Hawk, his intelligence sources said that the facility under Mount Mitchell is 20 stories deep. So these trucks went into that facility and disappeared. Um, Hawk said that one of the things that surprised him tremendously was um, how well the entrance to the underground facility is camouflaged. It looks just like part of the mountain. Um, And this is true in other places also. Yeah, uh, Mary, are, are these five places, you know, if you look on uh, Google Earth, are, are these uh, five places in a uh, some kind of straight line or, or you know, five places, uh, uh, you know, these five no, places? No, they're, they're can- not in a straight line. I suspect they might all, it's a possibility they're all connected uh, underneath the ground by uh, almost like an underground subway system. Uh, but no, they're not in a straight line. Do, do they form a, a pentagram? Nope. I don't okay. know if there's much of <laughs> You're looking for that esoteric connection. You're oh, looking I, for I that, just, and I don't I, see it. I don't okay, see well, it. I, I don't have Google Earth on in front of me. You get the number five. A lot of times that stuff does show up with these, you know, these kind of uh, ideologies. I, I know the, pen, I know the pen, uh, Pentagon shape is uh, very popular in in certain realms. I do not see that shape, no matter how I look at it. Okay, I, I just I, I think just it's more determined by uh, the underground structures. Uh, I think one of the reasons that the mountains uh, have so many facilities is because they can expand on natural caverns underneath the, the mountains. So, uh, so uh, aside from trucks being driven into the uh, mountain, uh, what else are people telling you? Or are you getting reports from people who who have seen this? Um, I'm going to jump to the uh, Smoky Mountain National Park again. We had another. Um, former military man and his wife, who had also been in the military, as our key uh, whistleblowers. And not only did they bring the military knowledge with them, but uh, they're kind of bold and they ask questions and they actually uh, were able to get a number of photos which are in the book. Mm -hmm. Um, It all started when they were, um, they noticed this unusual truck just north of the intersection of Highway 74 and 441 um, on the south side of Cherokee. And Cherokee as a community and as an Indian nation is adjacent to the Smoky Mountain National Park. Um, They said that this first truck that they saw looked like it was carrying a decontamination uh, equipment. And the the man who we call Clark Uh, went up and talked to the driver, who was a woman, and she didn't know what she was carrying on the back, she said. Uh, But she did tell him it belonged to the Air Force and that uh, she was waiting there for, I believe, five other trucks and escorts, and they were going to uh, go in a caravan uh, through the Newfound Gap, which is what connects uh, North Carolina, like with Gatlinburg, Tennessee. And... 
so they waited around. This couple waited around in their car at a distance and just watched uh, what happened. And the other five tractor trailers arrived. They were all covered with tarps that said uh, USAF on it or United States Air Force. And at the very end, uh, white SUVs showed up, and the drivers were dressed in black and were carrying um, weapons. And they were the escorts for this caravan. So again, at a distance, um, Clark and his wife followed this caravan, and it turned into a campground, which is known as the Smoke Mont Campground. It's very near the Welcome Center on the North Carolina side. And they watched all the trucks drive in there, and as soon as they were all through the gate, the gate was closed and nobody else could go in. Um, just very recently, I got um, a response from somebody who had read my book, and he said a few years earlier he had seen uh, a similar caravan go into the same campground, and he thought it was really, really odd because it was wintertime, and... Uh, uh, it was huge equipment on the back of the trucks, and he didn't understand why that kind of equipment would go into a uh, a pretty quiet campground, especially in the wintertime. So that gives you some idea. But we've had reports of people on um, uh, all-terrain vehicles that have been driving in the park or riding in the park, and they've run into park rangers, um, and I put that in quotation marks because... Uh, they had machine guns, and they told the people to turn back. Um, the man, Clark, also was able to get pictures of um, huge uh, cargo planes. I don't know if they were uh, C-130s, but something that would have the uh, gate at the back. And he saw them fly out of the park uh, from a low elevation, and as they were pulling out of the park, he could see the back uh, doors or cargo uh, gates closing as they flew over him. He got a picture of one of those. He also got pictures of um, different types of helicopters, uh, uh, ospreys uh, that would make drops of equipment uh, into the park. Um, he also saw, let's see, what do you call it, um, a sky crane or an air crane, uh, the kind that can, you know, drop an entire... Um, railroad car size package uh, into the ground or onto the ground. Uh, so he was really good at catching uh, things with his camera, and I'm very fortunate he was able to share that with us. Yeah, I, the, a, a, a park ranger walking around with a machine gun doesn't <laughs> sound like... It doesn't sound like Jellystone Park, does it? No, it sure doesn't, and that's why I said I put it in quotes, because it's highly doubtful that they were really park rangers if they had that kind of uh, machinery on them. Well, now, if they were UN troops, they could have, uh, you know, because they do carry it overseas in a lot of countries. That could be, could be. But these were dressed like park rangers. So. <laughs> and they closed off a road at, uh, that's near where we think the entrance is. Um, and they said they closed it because of a washout. Well, there had not been rain when that was closed. There was no evidence after they finally opened the road again that uh, there had ever been a washout. And to top it off, um, two men who worked for the fish hatchery in um, on the reservation or on the on the Indian property, they noticed that the water level in the river that fed the hatchery was getting really, really low. So they started taking the, the dirt road along the river up the mountain to find out if a beaver dam or something had uh, plugged up the river. And uh, they also ran into, um, you know, obstacles. And when they got to the uh, reservoir, which was always filled with water, they found that it was empty. But smack in the middle of it, there was a... A uh, 50,000 gallon tank, uh, water tank, uh, mostly buried in the old reservoir, and there were pipes going from the tank down into the ground. So that would indicate that uh, water was being diverted uh, to something underground. By the way, the men lost their jobs because of what they discovered. <laughs> 
get on. So, 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 so what could be the purpose of it? Are uh, you know people? Yeah, you know, could be showering, living underground, using that much water with this tank and the pipes going under. What? Uh, uh, is there some kind of small city under under there? Um, at another location that we just referred to as the Perry Center, which is the one that's near the Devil's Courthouse, um, that has we've had two people. Uh, one in particular, both of them had high security clearance, especially one of them. And uh, they were so concerned about the information that they were sharing uh, that we had to be really, really cautious. And the man gave us a written statement. He went to the extreme of changing his writing style because he didn't want people to be able to identify him in any way whatsoever. And I include his entire written statement which is not lengthy, but it's word for word, and I have that in the book. And he and the other um, key witness said that there was a city-sized underground facility there um, that was six stories deep. That, uh, from what I can put together, is the oldest of the five that I talk about in the book. It originally was a um, world, uh, well, let's say a Cold War uh, monitoring uh, station for the military. And supposedly it's been turned over to uh, the educators and it's just an astronomical research um, location. Uh, there's many reasons to doubt that it's uh, just that. Um, we had a couple guys who had been in the Air Force who uh, surveilled that facility for a while and on at least one occasion they saw uh, a gate which is sometimes open to the public and sometimes isn't, but saw somebody dressed in um, squat, uh, what do you call it? Um, late at night, my brain stops. Anyhow, it's the uh, military gear at the front gate. So if this is just an astronomical research place that's uh, open for the public, then why would you sometimes have a guard at the gate in military gear? Uh, by the way, it would be a SWAT outfit that they described. So there's multiple things going on. One of the witnesses at the Perry location, uh, as a young man, had worked at a tree farm in the area, and uh, people who worked there had seen people taking caged animals into this facility. Um, there could very well be a genetic experimentation going on at that particular facility. I don't think that's going on at all of them, but that one is highly suspected. Okay, so who's who would be doing the uh, genetic testing? Is 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 it uh, UN, uh, American government, just uh, military? Um. All of I think it's clandestine things. I think I think uh, branches. I think aspects of our military are involved in projects like this, but not all of them. Uh, for example, with Hawk at the Mount Mitchell facility, he and his squads were working for those within the government and within the military who did not want. Um, they wanted to be prepared in case they needed to defend against um, intruders into our our uh, our land. So they're not all united within the military, from what I've been able to piece together. Hmm. Okay, that's kind of some scary thoughts, isn't it? Uh, yeah, there's a there's a. Well, it's appropriate. We have Halloween coming up, so I might as well get into all the, the scary stuff. I think the <laughs> underground facilities were uh, originally built just to um, have a retreat place in case there was a disaster. Uh, the oldest one that I'm aware of is up in um, West Virginia, at Virginia border. And oh, it's beneath, uh, yeah, beneath uh, the old hotel. That is such an old facility now, it is open to the public. Uh, it originally was built so that the people from Washington who were important could escape there should there be a nuclear attack. Uh, 
So if you want to tour a, a very old facility, you can take a look at that and then begin to imagine what they might have done in all the years since then, because I, I'm sure the ones that are active today are much more sophisticated. All the locals knew knew where it, it was located and what it was for. It's not like that's, you know, pe- people are just learning about it now, but... It, when it, it was it, first built, I think it was pretty sacred. Yeah, it, yeah maybe <laughs> then, but yeah, I... Yeah, you hear it uh, advertised on TV, and uh, you know it's it, it's 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 discuss- it's becoming well known. But you, you, know, you, you know, the interesting thing about you know, your books and uh, our uh, guests from last hour is all this underground stuff that's always you know just kind of been there. It's been part of ancient cultures as well. That's correct. It, it, it's uh, it, yeah. It, is there a connection with uh, Sedona? Are there is similar things going going on out there? The reason I wrote the book is because I couldn't find anything that had been writ- written about underground facilities in. Uh, the Appalachian Mountains, especially in in North Carolina. There's been a lot actually written about things out west. And Mm -hmm. so I wasn't interested in just, um, you know, adding that to a book uh, to cover the whole country because I just don't believe in duplicating things that have already been done. So this is going to be new material to to just about everybody, including people that live in this area. Most people do not know this is going on, though they... Those that are very observant will have seen some things that they find very uh, out of place, very strange. Uh, This is a minor thing, but I just heard from somebody recently that in a a small community on the west side of uh, Cherokee, uh, it's called Bryson City, and they said that they have seen um, Air Force people eating at a little restaurant there on a regular basis. And the question was, what are Air Force people doing in Bryson City when there's no air base anywhere close to here? So uh, little things like that, you begin to piece them together and you get the oddest ways of uh, adding to the credibility of what's actually going on there. Yeah, it, uh, Mary, we had a question from uh, Karen Kay in the chat room, and she wants to know if... Uh, there is some kind of underground base under the Masonic Monument at Black Balsam. Um, that Masonic base is very has been there from I think goes back to at least the 1930s, and I've been there. It is very close to that. Uh, in fact, the road that takes you there is the road that was closed for two years that uh, is very close to where we believe the entrance is to that facility. Um, When you put that together with the fact that there's so much Masonic symbolism in the Denver airport, and there's been so much reported about an underground facility there, uh, you begin to wonder what the Masonic connection might be. Um, but she's right. It's right there on the uh, right there, right there where it's happening. Uh, another person with some military background had gone up there to take some pictures of that monument, and uh, her testimony is in the book also. But when she got up there, at that time the road was closed and the gate was down, so she parked her car and walked walked beyond it, um, and she could feel and hear major mechanical sounds from beneath the ground. Um, She said sometimes it sounded like uh, the sound you would hear if somebody's uh, pounding pylons for a bridge into the ground uh, and there was mechanical grinding sounds and there's nothing around and yet this was happening. She also had a, a physical experience when it was a beautiful day and when she was driving up to the mountain where this Masonic uh, monument is located. Um, the birds were singing, the sun was shining, it was a perfect day, she was happy. Uh, but the longer she was up there, she noticed that 
there were no more bird sounds. It got very, very quiet except for the vibrations from beneath the ground. And she began to feel uh, very nauseated and didn't begin to feel better until she finally left the area. Um, this is not the first re report we've gotten of um, perhaps electronic uh, energy being pulsed out uh, that will keep people uh, away from areas. Um, I've experienced that myself when I've gone up to the Perry Center. And when you get close, you just get this very um, oppressive feeling. Uh, it's like you don't want to be there. Um, I've been with other people at the, doing, having the same experience. So I think that they might very well do things like that to uh, keep people at a distance. Uh, so, since you've been, been uh, you know, to the one near, near you and you know, you're feeling weird, what could be causing that? You know, would they like, be shooting out like some kind of like... Probably some play? type of an electric probably some kind of an electronic pulse or something of that yeah, nature. Okay. Electromagnetic, something like that. Hmm. And it's not uncommon. I mean, um, the location uh, at Sugarloaf Mountain, <clears throat> excuse me, um, people experience similar things. Okay. So, so, so that's a way to repel people. And uh, sun gazer uh, wanted to know about uh, uh, Dulce, uh, Dulce, or Dulce, the Dulce place. That, that's out west. It seems to be the creepiest one in the whole country. Um, that is not part of what I've personally investigated. Uh, okay. Again, because it's been written about, there's a lot of videos, there's a lot of books, there's a lot of testimonies that have been done about uh uh, that facility, and I have not chosen to to uh, okay. duplicate those efforts. Okay, uh, maybe that was the one I meant to say. I, I, I think I may have said the wrong one, but uh, okay, that's uh, okay. So now that's the one I want. Okay, so yeah, uh, uh, v v very unusual. And, and are are there any UFO sightings associated yes, with there are. these? Okay. We do see UFOs throughout this area. That's the, the reason that we started the website in the first place, because there were so many sightings. Um, there have been UFOs um, seen in all of the areas where these uh, facilities are. Uh, I get the most reports from the one at the Perry Center. Um, there's even been reports of, uh, of UFOs uh, going in and out of a lake that's just to the west of that facility. Um, we see all different kinds of UFOs in this area. I suspect some are man-made and some are from out there. Uh, they come in just about every size and shape and color. Um, and Those some very, fine. very unusual ones. Uh, people can look under, again, on the home page, there's something called Skyship Photos. If you scroll down through the ones for this year, um, there's some UFOs that look like asteroids. Um, they're not lit up like some of the UFOs are, and they simply look like rocks. Um, but we've been able to uh, to get some photos, and those are on the website. Those are the most different ones I have ever seen. Um, but Is we have all the other kinds. Any reports of abductions in that area? Um, believe it or not. I have never had an abduction um, witness come forward in this area uh, ever. That doesn't mean that perhaps it hasn't happened. Um, I certainly am aware of reports from other places, uh, but I have not had anybody come forward about that here. Well, so, well if it was government, they wouldn't be abducting people. <laughs> That's what I was getting at, you know. <laughs> and just round them up on the street. Well, if they're doing genetic testing, you have to wonder who is it that they're doing the genetic testing on. So obviously somebody somebody knows about it. Uh, there's a uh, the community that's real close to the Perry Center. Uh, when you try to get people to talk from that area, uh, they're very, very closed mouth. Uh, we did get a testimony, and again, it's in the book, 
by somebody who was a social worker in the area. And there were reports of satanic things going on near that facility. Um, when it was reported, the person said that everybody above them just kept it real hush-hush. So I guess that would feed into, um, you know, the darker side of what might be going on. So, 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 so nothing uh, really uh, positive to n normal human beings is really happening there? Say that again? It, it, like, n nothing positive is happening at, at these places? Um, you know, like if, the, one, if the one I've referred to that I call PERI, which stands for Pisca Astronomical Research Organization, uh, or Institute, and it does have uh, the appearance of being an astronomy facility, uh, but I think what goes underneath it is uh, quite different. Um, let's see. Ask your question again. Let's see if I can come up with an answer for you. No, no, I, I, you answered. I, I, you know, you're talking about some of the you know darker uh, reports, and I, I, I just. Thought that uh, yeah, there yeah, it's, 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 the, it, it's the just Perry facility is the only one that I am getting reports of genetic or uh, experimentation on humans. Uh, I was told by one of the witnesses that they have the ability to uh, use electromagnetic energy to wipe out memories on people. Um, that's not good. Of all the of all the five that I've written about, that would would seems to have the darkest element to it. Mm -hmm. uh, the other ones, I'm not getting reports like that. Uh, I'm not saying they might not be doing it too, um, but uh, I don't hear the dark stuff as much. Uh, it's kind of interesting. The the one um, at Sugarloaf Mountain, uh, one of the reports that sticks in my mind is that. Um, um, one of the witnesses and, and her husband had actually seen tire tracks that disappear into a cement wall at the top of the uh, mountain. And as you know, there's always a bumper or something on the front of a car so that a tire cannot make a print right up to the wall. Well, in this case, the tire prints go right up to the wall. So you have to suspect that that wall moves and there must be an elevator or something just beyond that. Otherwise, the tracks wouldn't butt up against the wall itself. And there, again, there's been UFOs seen over that mountain. Um, one night, the woman um, and her husband uh, noticed that the whole top of the mountain was lit up. And the lights, floodlights were on the top of it all night long. And there were helicopters that dropped heavy equipment. Um, the next, and they, they, it, you know, they finished by the end of the night. Uh, the next day, she and her husband were very curious, and they went beyond the gate and went way up there to see what had been going on. And there was fresh sod put down, and uh, she said the whole shape of the mountain at that point had changed. So something big was going on there. Okay, uh, that's r r really weird. Now, do, have, since you've been talking openly about... Uh, yeah, you know, this kind of stuff. Uh, have you had uh, men in black visit or sightings? Um, I have not, and I think that uh, uh, we can't all be cowered into a corner. Um, there's just so much going on that needs to be corrected, and there are things being changed. And I still hang on to hope that uh, uh, the good guys with the white hats will still win in the long run. Okay, well, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure this discussion tonight got us a new uh, file started at uh, some organization. Um, who knows? <laughs> if you're not on the list already, yeah, I yeah, you ought to be ashamed. Yeah, okay, that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> and if if you feel more comfortable, we can go back to talking about uh, tangible evidence of Jesus or the underground uh, tunnels from the Cherokee little people, and we won't have to worry about... Have, have you learned anything new about them? 
Uh, I, I found them fascinating. Uh, what, the Cherokee? Yeah, yes, ma'am. Uh, since the book came out, I've been contacted by several people. Uh, one man had been a student at the uh, university, which is Western Carolina University, uh, back in 1999-2000. And he said one day he and some of his buddies were just off campus along the river, just goofing off, and the head of security walked by them, and he was carrying a box that they described as a little bit bigger than a shoebox. And he actually uh, got engaged into a conversation with these uh, students. And he said that uh, uh, they had found more of the little skeletons when they were doing a new construction project. And so he was taking those bones out to an ATV trail to rebury them. And uh, what, they, what they've done whenever things were being built at that campus, when they would find things like that, they would try to um, keep it quiet so that the building projects wouldn't be stopped. And uh, so that was something that came in since the book came out. Uh, I also have put a story on the website this year, uh, again, under the Bigfoot section, and a construction man uh, told me that when they were building uh, a large facility about five miles away from the campus, they cut into a mountain. And around here, or any place in the mountains, they will cut a vertical line into a mountain and create like a ledge that they can build on. And it was one of those kind of situations. And when they cut into the mountain, they found five of these little tunnels. And when I talk about little tunnels, they're uh, generally about two, two and a half feet in uh, width and about three and a half feet tall square cut except the uh, top part of the tunnel is uh, rounded which gives it um, you know more stability and he said when they cut into that mountain he said the clay which is this dense red clay was as fresh as if it had just been cut uh, he said there were no cobwebs or anything um, he also noticed that there were tool marks on the side of the or on the walls so something had been used to um, uh, level out or smooth out the, the side of these tunnels. So those are two reports that have come in since I did that book, Cherokee Little People Were Real. Yeah, you know, uh, Mary, you know, you know, we were talking the other day and that, you know, that uh, uh, you know, Caleb Atwater's 1820 book, uh, the Antiquities in Ohio, or so, uh, whatever the title is. Uh, he, yeah, he he also mentions the the possibility of uh, uh, people of small stature being found in, in Ohio. Uh, yeah, these legends just seem to persist. Uh, there's uh, reports. There are reports and evidence of little people around the world. Um, the reason I did this book was because it had not been acknowledged in this area at all, and the the 11 people that I interviewed, for the most part, were very elderly, and nobody had recorded the information. So when I realized that that information was going to die with these people. Um, I did uh, interviews with them and uh, transcribed them. I did that back in 2000 and just turned it over to the museum just so uh, somebody would have a record of it. And it wasn't until um, 2014 that I actually put it in book form and went back and got photos and got um, maps and, and made the testimonies of the people um, become more um, believable, I guess. Um, so it's, uh, and all three books that I've done have one thing in common. Every subject's different, but each book has lots of pictures or maps or photographs, and I write in a very condensed, easy-to-read style. I'm, uh, I used to be a newspaper editor, and I write in a, that condensed fashion, uh, hopefully not quite as dry as newspaper writing can be. And... Uh, it's an easy read for people. 
there's so much fascinating information in the world and so many academics bury it in these uh, very large, thick books that most people don't have the time or the patience to sit down and really read. So I try to be the bridge between, uh, let's say, the scientist and the archaeologist um, and us regular people. And each of my books has been designed with that purpose in mind. And, and you have done some lectures recently. Do you have any more coming up? Um, I have some projects that uh, um, involve uh, film and things like that that I, at this point, cannot talk about. But okay. just know that there's some things cooking, and if we're lucky, they will hatch. How's that for an answer? Okay. That's fine. We'll have to have you come back and talk about those projects, too. All righty. I hope, I hope it all falls in place the way it's supposed to. And I certainly will let you know um, if we get a good report on the Bigfoot DNA. Um, oh, yeah. That would be awesome to hear. The only person who's really stuck their neck out regarding that is Dr. Melba Ketchum. And she's taken a lot of flack uh, because some people just are not willing to believe that uh, um, the Bigfoot might be a cross between some unknown species and a human. You know, and, human. Um, and that the thing that makes the Bigfoot different is always in the paternal side. So that's why it's so important to be able to get something with the nuclear DNA. Well, we sure appreciate you coming on, folks. We uh, uh, hope you check out our site, which is www.skyshipsovercashiers.com. Go check her out. Let us know what you think. Uh, we enjoyed it. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Mary.